Well, by now I'm sure you've heard about the uh, big wildfires going on in and near the city of Gatlinburg, Tennessee. It's been devastating for so many people, and we're getting some aftermath pictures. Even though it's still going on, there are places that have already burned where, you know, they are dealing with the aftermath. Look at that fire. I mean, some of the scariest videos that I've ever seen um, came out of this fire, trying to drive some down some of those mountains um, and escape it. Look at this picture in particular, okay? This is unbelievable. What you're seeing here is actually melted metal that came off the rims. I believe this is likely aluminum. And just kind of looking this up, the temperature that it takes to uh, melt aluminum is 1,200 degrees, okay? So over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, as you know already, this was an incredibly uh, devastating fire. Just a couple numbers here. Over 70 people have been injured. Um, at least seven people were killed. And 700 plus buildings have been damaged or destroyed in these wildfires. Right about 15,000 acres that have been burned. Only 10% containment so far, even with a little bit of rain that we've had. Hello, Marcus. Hey, Marcus. Hey, good morning. Yeah, taking a look at what's trending this morning. Those wildfires in Tennessee just uh, caused widespread damage across the area. One of the places affected, the Dollywood theme park, one of their employees was cleaning up some of the debris in the park and found this, a page from the Bible. The page from Joel chapter 1 says, To you, Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Isaac McCord, uh, is that employee who found it, works in the HR department at Holly Dollywood, says he found the page under a bench and it was soaking wet, posted it on Facebook, and it's been shared 125,000 times. So it just gave him goosebumps when he found that and he read it. Frequent lightning and heavy rainfall. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says that he intends to seek backing from U.S. President-elect Donald Trump to create a Palestinian state this coming year. He's pointing out that not much is known about the incoming American leaders' policies, and that this could be an ideal time for the Palestinians to finally gain independence. One of the key sticking points in reaching an agreement has always been Abbas's refusal of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's demands that Israel be recognized as a Jewish state. But Abbas went even further afield during his lengthy address at the ongoing Congress of his Fatah party by threatening to entirely withdraw any recognition of Israel whatsoever. The PA chief has often issued similar warnings, but has yet to completely sever all ties with the Jewish state. Vladimir Vladimirovich Russia is willing to reconcile its relations with the United States and is ready to cooperate with President-elect Donald Trump. In his annual State of the Nation address, Vladimir Putin refrained from his usual criticism of Washington and outlined his vision for U.S.-Russian ties. We are ready for cooperation with the new U.S. administration. It is important to normalize and start developing bilateral ties on equal and mutually beneficial grounds. Cooperation between Russia and the U.S. in solving global and regional issues meets the interests of the whole world. We have a common responsibility in providing international security and stability and strengthening the non-proliferation regimes. I would like to underline that attempts to break strategic parity are very dangerous and can lead to global catastrophe. Key world powers have been unable to reach a consensus on 
easing the conflict in the Syrian city of Aleppo. An emergency UN Security Council meeting was called by France with the aim of halting the offensive in the city to allow in humanitarian aid. But it descended into delegates trading accusations on obstructing the process. The Security Council does not come together to answer the cries of the civilians that we have heard about again today because Russia, a permanent member, doesn't want to. That's it. It's very straightforward. This Security Council has completely failed to act. Russia has vetoed time and again to prevent the Security Council from finding the unity necessary to end this war. It is important to note that while Russian envoy Vitaly Cherkin was speaking, uh, U.S. Ambassador Samantha Power actually stormed out of the room. Now, that's a, that's a common diplomatic gesture. That's a way of expressing dis disgust or disapproval or protest to the comments of another diplomat. Now, we reported yesterday that people in an Islamist compound are stockpiling guns in preparation for the Trump administration. We're going to show you a map on the screen which lists all of the compounds all across the country. This is the Islamist group. They claim they've got compounds all over the place. Joining us now is the man who brought us the report. His name is Ryan Morrow, National Security Analyst with the Clarion Project. Right, you've got people inside these compounds? We do. We have um, a significant number of people who are operating not just inside the compounds, but also among those that are living outside the compounds. It's a group called Muslims of America. Uh, they used to be known as Jamaat al fukra but then they carried out a bunch of terrorist attacks and decided to drop the name. It ultimately culminated in one of the camps being shut down in 1992 in Colorado. The rest of the infrastructure remained, including these same villages that you've been talking about. Now, they're accumulating weapons, assault rifles, explosives. Yes. Uh, what do they say amongst themselves that they're going to do with these weapons? It depends on who they're talking to, because sometimes they'll lie to their own members. So in some cases, they'll say this is for self-defense, which is also sometimes how you describe jihad. Sometimes it's more blatantly referred to as jihad. But this arming and this type of training that they've going on, has been going on, and we've got video of some of the training going on at their headquarters called Islamburg in New York State, has been going on since the beginning. What the breaking news is that we heard from multiple sources, and they provided information to substantiate this, is that with the election of Donald Trump, they believe that their end times prophecies that they believe in are now being fulfilled. Donald Trump is part of a satanic Jewish conspiracy and they are preparing for the camps to be raided and what? to fight back. More conflict seems imminent at Standing Rock. According to Reuters, veterans stand for Standing Rock. A contingent of more than 2,000 U.S. military veterans are intent on reaching Standing Rock by this weekend. According to their Facebook page, they will build a human wall between police and protest organizers. This is in partial response to the state of North Dakota mandating that protesters vacate the camp. Eric, some of the videotape that has been produced by RT clearly shows that there are tactics being used against these protesters. Uh, rubber bullets have not only been pointed and shot at the protesters, but at journalists. Uh, cold water being sprayed on those protesters. What if this happens to your 2,000 veterans? What if your veterans are treated the same way these protesters? Have you thought about Plan B? Well, I think that it's unfortunate that you have to ask that question simply uh, for the fact that um, we should all worry that this is happening already. It doesn't necessarily need to happen to one of us. I think the difference is that um, when we go there, we are not just, um, you know, uh, Latinos, blacks, or whites. We are uh, veterans. So uh, they will be shooting or threatening the uniform of the United States military. Security researchers at Israeli software security company Checkpoint revealed yesterday that a fresh Android security breach has resulted in more than 1 million Google accounts being hacked. The Android devices were infected with the malware nicknamed Gooligan that steals email information and authentication tokens and gains access to personal details and files. Checkpoint immediately contacted the Google security team and the two groups are working together to find the source of the virus and remove the threat. Checkpoint did not say if they know of any specific group suspected of being behind the hack. In a blog post published yesterday, Checkpoint called Gooligan the largest Google account breach to date, and the malware can affect machines running Android 4 versions Jellybean and KitKat, and Android 5 version Lollipop, 
which comprises over 74% of Android users. In August, Checkpoint exposed four security flaws that they said could potentially affect some 900 million Android phones. Anyone who believes that they may have been victim to this attack is advised to immediately change their password and any other account security related information. The FBI has been given current block to hack victims of cyber crimes. Congress failed to block the controversial Rule 41 proposal in its final hours yesterday. Three times Wednesday, a group of bipartisan senators tried to keep an amendment to Rule 41 from going through on December 1st. And three times, they failed. The new change to Rule 41 will regularly allow judges to issue search warrants to hack into computers outside that judge's jurisdiction. A single search warrant can now serve to hack into numerous computers in multiple jurisdictions. So a judge in Texas can issue a single warrant to the FBI to hack into computers in California, Alaska, New York, even beyond our country's borders. This expanded authority will likely be used to investigate botnets where thousands or even millions of private computers are infected with malicious software. The government now has the ability to hack the victim's computers in any jurisdiction, even abroad, to investigate the botnet. And they can do it without your knowledge or consent. Meanwhile, the British government is taking it a step further by allowing its spying agencies to hack into people's computers without their knowledge. It's also requiring internet service providers to keep a record of every internet user's browsing history for one year so government agencies can have access to it. Supporters of the legislation say it's essential for keeping the UK secure. Home Secretary Amber Rudd says the internet presents new opportunities for terrorists and law enforcers and security services must have the tools they need to keep people safe. But its detractors are many, and they include practically every major technology and internet company. Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft and Google, they all urged the government not to put this bill through. MPs also objected, although they put up no real opposition, it has to be said, once they'd got themselves exempted from being spied on. Internet activists, the Open Rights Group, say the new law is more suited to a dictatorship than a democracy. It gives Britain arguably the most draconian spying powers in the developed world. Major controversy developing tonight involving the Texas couple who host the popular HGTV show Fixer Upper. They find themselves the target of a critical article by a big-time website and a writer who apparently doesn't really love where this couple goes to church. The piece is on the website BuzzFeed under the headline, Chip and Joanna Gaines' church is firmly against same-sex marriage. Megan, they have a hit show, they're best-selling authors, and Texas Monthly Magazine credits them with revitalizing the city of Waco. But now BuzzFeed has broken the news that Fixer Upper host Chip and Joanna Gaines attend an evangelical church in Texas where the pastor is against same-sex marriage. Turns out Pastor Jimmy Siebert believes, as nearly half of all Christians do according to Pew Research, that marriage should be between a man and a woman. A short time ago, the pastor was asked by FoxNews.com's Todd Starnes if his church is anti-gay. Watch. We are not only not anti-gay, we are just uh, pro-helping people uh, in their journey to find out who God is and who he's made them to be. But the thing is, we don't know how Chip and Joe Gaines feel about same-sex marriage because BuzzFeed published the story without getting an answer from them. And here's BuzzFeed's reasoning, quoting, Fixer Upper has fans of all stripes. Christians, feminists, and LGBT viewers have all found something to love in the Gaineses. So in the absence of a response from them or their representatives, it's worth looking at the severe, unmoving position Pastor Siebert and Antioch Church take on same-sex marriage. In other words, guilt by association. If this type of attack on Christian beliefs sounds familiar, you'll recall in 2014, the Benham Brothers had a show on HGTV, and when they came out against gay marriage, the LGBT community protested, sponsors pulled their ads, HGTV fired them. Good evening, thanks for joining us tonight. From outrage to resolution in a matter of hours after the city in Menominee in Michigan removed a nativity scene from a public park. That scene was displayed at the Banshell at Menominee Marina Park for several years, but after complaints about the religious display being on public property, they took it down. New at 6, George Rodas found out people won't have to wait long to see the exhibit on public display once again. 
Pastor David Pennell is glad to have saved his Savior. Only hours after learning the nativity scene was removed, he took the religious exhibit off the city's hands and to his homeless shelter. You know, it's kind of appropriate that the baby Jesus' home is now at the homeless shelter, seeing there was no room at the inn for him. Only two days on the job, Menominee City Manager Tony Graff realized the display had to go. N normally, you know, your honeymoon period lasts more than two days. Graff says legitimate arguments made by the Madison-based Freedom From Religion Foundation led to the removal. The group argued against the crash being displayed on public property. Graff says he's glad his community was upset. I'm actually overjoyed that people care because it still shows that, you know, this community along with, you know, our country still believes in, you know, the founding fathers, you know, freedom of religion. Pastor Purnell says the nativity scene will be on display right here in front of their shelter and much to his pleasure it'll be the first thing anyone sees as they cross the bridge into town. It's almost kind of a divine intervention that now many people will see it instead of just the ones that go downtown. New policies set to have a massive impact on the future of abortion regulations in Texas. Beginning next month, medical providers will have to change the way they treat aborted fetuses. Instead of disposing them into sanitary sewer systems or landfills, they'll have to either cremate or bury the remains. You know, we're very thankful that these rules were implemented. Nicole Hudgens is the state outreach coordinator for Texas Values, an organization that supports pro-life initiatives. These unborn children are going to be treated with dignity and respect um, by being buried or cremated rather than being thrown into a landfill. It has never happened in the state of Wisconsin until now. Across the state, each and every ballot cast in the presidential election is being counted again. We got off to a slower start than we anticipated. The ballot is rejected. In Milwaukee, at the request of the Green Party, each and every ballot machine was tested, taking extra hours. In Waukesha, they too were slow out of the gate. Obviously, today is really, really kind of iffy because we don't know how long each step is going to take. Eventually, recount workers hit their stride the very few problems. In Brown Deer, it was discovered one person sent in two absentee ballots. In Milwaukee County, some ballots rejected. There have been a couple that have been rejected because they were improperly filed. Eight to be exact. And it does not have those signatures. The first municipality to finish their recount, the tiny village of River Hills, one worker says the numbers matched up perfectly with election day results. Onlookers include representatives from the Clinton, Green, and Trump campaigns. And I'm not quite sure why they wanted to file and have this. And it, I don't know if it was because they wanted to give money to the state of Wisconsin and pay that fee, but uh, we're here anyhow. Hillary Clinton trails Donald Trump by over 22,000 votes. There is no indication the numbers have shifted very much after the recount's first day. And I'm hoping that, that it works out in terms of the, the equipment and the machinery. Green Party leaders say they are pleased with how the day went. When asked about criticism from Republicans that this is a waste of time and money. I say wait till day 12. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We just start. For the first time in 11 years, Corey Grimes will spend this Christmas at home in Colorado. Life's been rough for the single father. Wash the dishes, make sure everything gets put away properly. Caring for his son with autism and working part-time at a restaurant. Pay my bills, uh, help out with my son, get him what he needs. Every paycheck is quickly spent on bills. So when his van needed work, he tried to fix it himself with no luck. And we didn't know what to do. There was a bunch of pieces that fell apart when I took it apart. Corey took the car to Chris Oakley at CNT Auto, who fixed the transmission. The price for parts and labor, around 1500 bucks. He's trying to make ends meet out of nothing. But after hearing Corey's story, Chris decided something early on. It was fixed. It was his. Free to go. That $1,500 bill, gone. What he did was awesome. Um, you know, never would have expected something like that before. An early Christmas gift for a man struggling to get by. He's trying to make ends meet out of nothing. And I just thought, you know what, after he told me that, there's no use in charging somebody that, that don't have the money. It took five months for Corey to come up with the money. I went there with the cash in hand, ready to go, and they said no, they didn't want my money, and... Merry Christmas. He left with a working van, his money, and a full tank of gas. A gift from a stranger Corey will never forget. So now I have money for Christmas. I can buy stuff for my son. And what a gift that is. Yeah.